Well, good morning. God is good. And all the time. It is really good to see you all here at Finley Lake Church. I just want to welcome you all. If you are a guest, my name is Pastor Dave, and we're just really glad you've joined us for worship this morning. One of the verses we'll be looking at later in the service is Psalm 34, 8, and it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. And we have a world that is presenting a whole buffet of options for things people can try to um, taste and see if it's good, if it's helpful. But the scriptures teach us to taste and see that the Lord is good. And that's really great news for us this morning as we gather here. And if we're, if we're tired and worn out and need some strength, taste and see that the Lord is good. Um, if you're going through a rough time in your life, taste and see the Lord is good. If you have just a, a good normal summer, uh, today's a new day to taste and see that the Lord is good. And we'll be really focusing on that a little later in the service. But I just want to welcome you all again. So as we uh, enter into worship, let's, let's bow in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your holy, loving presence here with us today. We thank you, Lord, that you are ready to rush into our hearts like a mighty rushing wind if we will simply open the door. And so, Jesus, we, we ask for you to come and fill us once again today. We pray, Lord, that your power, your love, your grace, your mercy would flow into us, that we would receive your healing, your strength, your hope, and that, Lord, then you would send us back out into the world to be wholehearted followers of Jesus who live to make your love and grace known to the world around us. God, as we worship you today, we pray that you would be pleased and glorified, lifted up, honored through everything that happens here. Um, Lord, you, you promise that if you are lifted up, you will, you will br draw all people to yourself. So God, that's our prayer, that as we exalt the name of Jesus with our praise and worship, that you would be lifted up, that you would bring us near, that you would remind us of your love, that you would fall afresh upon us, that we might be drawn together as the body of Christ, ready to reach this world for your glory. Lord, we pray all of this in the wonderful, saving name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. The scripture today is Psalms 34, 1 through 8. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glorify in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Amen. Well, this morning, once again, we are in our series called Think Peace. And as we've been talking about every week, we're, we're using this Isaiah 26, 3 verse as our theme verse. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. You will keep in perfect peace. And I've been reminding us each week that that perfect peace is not two different Hebrew words, but it's just emphasizing one beautiful word, shalom. You will keep in shalom, shalom, all who trust in you. And that shalom is not just, oh, I'm not fighting anyone, so I'm, I'm at peace. But no, shalom is my life, my spirit, my body, my mind is at, is at peace. I'm experiencing, as we've been saying, a totality of well-being. I'm experiencing a flourishing as I, as I, as I find my life uh, in the presence of God, as I have grace and joy in my relationships with God and others. I'm experiencing this flourishing, this totality of well-being, which is what that biblical word for shalom means. And I've also been saying that this really helps put everything to perspective when we think about the Christmas story, that prophecy from Isaiah that says that Jesus came to be the prince of peace or the prince of shalom, which means he wants to be Lord over our lives, to govern our lives in such a way that as we uh, connect our lives, as we are the branches connected to the vine of Jesus, that as we uh, immerse ourselves, as we connect to the Prince of Peace and his grace flows through us, that he brings shalom to our minds, to our hearts, to our relationships, um, to our homes. And so God desires to bring this shalom. And one of the ways that shalom can be stolen or threatened is when our minds are not well. 
when we have those anxious thoughts that just continue to spin through our minds, when we find ourselves downcast, as we looked at uh, last week, as we find ourselves just with uncontrollable thoughts and feelings raging within us that can steal our shalom. And if Jesus is the Prince of Shalom, he wants to restore that. He wants to heal us. He wants to give us rest. And so today, we're looking at another thing that can prevent or steal shalom in our lives, and that's just the experience of trauma. Uh, that, that we've experienced in the past. And we want to do this in a way that brings healing. My prayer every week, you know, a couple weeks ago, Lord, help me to preach on anxiety without making people anxious. Last week it was, Lord, help me to preach on depression without being depressing. And Lord, today, help me to speak and preach on trauma in a way that would not uh, bring tra- more trauma, but in a way that would point us towards the hope we have in Jesus. And so we're looking at trauma today, and let's just take a deep breath and know that we are, um, we are just surrounded and filled by the grace of God who, who desires to bring uh, healing and hope and, and not to bring harm. And so we, we put our trust in the Lord as we look to him uh, in the areas of our trauma. So we're going we're gonna to trust the Lord to meet us. And for some, you know, I think we've all experienced some trauma in our lives. And I'm not here as a pastor to like diagnose someone with depression or anxiety or PTSD. There are professionals who would meet with us to do that. But, but my prayer is that we will turn our eyes upon Jesus to find hope and healing for whatever ails us. And so whether we're dealing with a medical situation, an actual diagnosis of something, or whether we just know what it's like to be overwhelmed by the painful memories of the past, we've all dealt with trauma in some way, shape, or form, and we want the Lord to bring healing and perspective and hope in our lives. And so that's, that's our focus as we lean in today. Um, one more thing I've been saying every week is that uh, I am all for a broad approach where, you know, there are medical professionals, there are mental health Christian counselors that can be of great help to us, but there's also the presence of God in our lives and his healing power through the truth of his word that can also bring that shalom and is most important when it comes to experiencing the healing power of God in our lives. And so um, that, that's our focus, that, that the Lord has so much to say in his word about experiencing health and well-being in our minds and our hearts, um, but we also recognize that the Lord sometimes uses a, a Christian counselor or a trusted friend or a medical professional who can also be a part of God's healing. We just want to have wisdom and discernment um, in, in our lives as we think about that. So let's, let's lean into this uh, topic of trauma this morning. I want to do that by talking about um, trees. In his book, Healing for Damaged Emotions, it's kind of old, but it's like a, a major bestseller when it comes to Christian books on damaged emotions and trauma. In his book, David Siemens uh, writes all about the sequoia and redwood trees. And if you've ever been out west, California, or other places where they have these trees, they are phenomenal. Some of these things you can drive a car through. It's, it's amazing. But there are places, there are national parks where some of these trees have been cut and they have fallen over, and a naturalist could take you to that tree, and they could point at each of the rings, and they could point out what the different rings mean or have meant in the life and the history of that tree. So they can, look, they can show you a ring and say, look, here is a ring that shows that this was a year of drought. The tree did not get enough water during this ring of the tree's life. And then they might show you a couple more rings where it's in this season, this tree actually had too much water. It was actually harmful to the tree because it was so wet. And they might point out another ring that shows, here's a, here's a ring that shows in that year of the tree's life that was dealing with disease. Or they can actually look at another ring and say, this tree was, was close to a forest fire, and you can point that out just by looking at the ring. It's fascinating to think that the rings of that tree tell a story about that tree's history, about the life of that tree. The good rings, the bad rings, it all shows that history of the tree. Did you know that you and I are a lot like that? We don't have bark. Some of you may have a bite. No, I'm kidding. But we we don't have bark. We don't have, you know, we're not physically constructed like that. We can't actually look inside and see this. But you and I are like those trees in a sense that the, the Lord sees this, and we can think back about a different year or a different season in our life. And the Lord could point out that that was a season where you were going through a very painful time. That was those years, those were years where you experienced bullying and mistreatment. Those were years where where you were dealing with such a, a, a feeling of insecurity, where you felt isolated, where you felt alone. 
On the flip side, the Lord could look at our lives and say, look at this time period in your life. That's when you were really pressing into me. You were growing in grace. The, the, the word of God was filling your mind. You were growing as a believer. Here's a, here's a healthy point in your life. You know, here's when you went through that traumatic stress and, and this is what it did to your emotions, to your, to your life. So I want us to think about our lives in that way, that if we look at the history of our lives, we can point to seasons where we have experienced great growth, but also times of trauma, times of pain. And, and we may put on a, a smile, we may put on an outer shell, we may cover up our lives with the bark that surrounds us, but the Lord knows where we have been wounded. The Lord knows where we have experienced trauma, where, where the way that we relate to people, our perspective on the world, how we view relationships, how we view the church, how we view uh, different families, how we approach people, all of that is affected by the rings of our lives, by the history that goes into who we are and our makeup. Does this make sense? I wonder if you can think about your life and think about maybe times, and this is where we need the grace of God in, in time to just reveal, you know, where have you experienced times of growth and grace, but also times of hurt and times of trauma, and the Lord wants to heal those areas in our lives. So the bottom line is we all have these scars from the wounds and the trauma of our past. And these scars or these wounds cause all kinds of relational and interpersonal struggles for us. You know, we might just have trust issues because we've been wounded in the past. We may have a hard time drawing close to other people because we just have that, that sense of they're not for my well-being. We may have a hard time approaching God because we think, well, my father was not a loving figure in my life. Mine was just... But we can't, we can't approach God. I don't know why I felt the need to say that. He's sitting right there. Um, you know, we might say, my, I can't get close to God as father because I had a father figure who was not loving, who was hurtful, who, who was distant, who was neglectful. And so that's a, there, there may have been rings of mistreatment that make it so now I have hard times trusting or drawing close to God because of that trauma in my life. So what is, what is trauma? Trauma is an emotional response to an intense event that threatens to cause harm or actually causes harm. And, and it's not so much that the ex event was the trauma, but just how we process it, how we, how we stuff it, how it affects us, oftentimes in very forgotten ways. You know, some of this stuff may be so stuffed down deep inside of us that we don't even know how it causes us to um, not, not draw close or, or to react with a lot of anxiety or anger or a loud voice or, you know, or fly off the handle or whatever whatever phrase you want to use, and it's like, what is causing that reaction? And we, we need to think, like, maybe it goes back to this place I haven't even thought about in 15, 20, 30, 40 years. But trauma often is a result of over, an overwhelming amount of stress that exceeds a person's ability to cope with or accept the emotions involved with that experience. And again, it might be a single event, that cause trauma, and so it, it's, it might be stuff, it might be something we think about, but it might be deep down there, or it might be more chronic, where it was, it was cum cumulative um, events that, that shaped us during a certain period of life. When we think about trauma, it's so broad, but it could be something like natural disasters. If somebody's been through a natural disaster, it could be a serious accident or a terrorist attack. I think about people who were in New York City on 9-11 and what did that, you, you see images of people walking covered in smoke and ash and what, you know, that's, that's a traumatic event. That was a terrorist attack. We think about war, abuse, assault, violence, bullying. This is all trauma. And PTSD has been called other names in the past. I mean, we think about World War I where the term shell shock was used. You know, that kind of fits. Um, in World War II, it was combat fatigue. So that was the term that was used to describe the impact, the trauma that soldiers had, had experienced and how that was affecting them. And, and so often we think about our, our heroes from the past and how they were so brave in battle, and yet then what do, what's often said in families? Oh, he served there, but he never talks about it right? It, it's deep down there. He, he never talks about it. And I think for a lot of us, that's what we do with trauma. It may not be the, the horrors of the battlefield, but it's something that's happened, and we stuff it deep down, and we just try to forget about it, but we're kind of like that little volcano. Kathy didn't mean to make that a metaphor, but it, it kind of like bubbles up at times, right? And we may not recognize what's causing it to bubble up like that, but if we really think and pray, we might realize, wow, maybe that trauma is manifesting itself in this way in my life. 
and the Lord wants to reveal that to me and help me to deal with it and to, to find healing and wholeness in that. You know, I think about times in my life where I've either been around others who have been experiencing trauma or, or myself, but I think about some friends. I had, some, I had a group of friends, and they were friends just because they were the kids who lived near me on the street. You know, probably a better way to pick friends is like, okay, who's going to be for my well-being? Who's going who's gonna to love me? Who's going to be a trusted friend? Usually as a nine-year-old, you're not making a moral inventory of your friends and whether or not they'll be a good friend or not, right? It's like, oh, Johnny lives up the street. I'll hang out with him, you know? So, um, and maybe that's like, you know, that's how it is for a lot of us. But, but I had a friend who, you know, sadly, he, we were the safe place when he was dealing with trauma. He lived up the road with his sisters and his mom and his mom's boyfriend, and there were multiple times where his mom's boyfriend would start drinking, and he'd get loud, and he'd get violent, and it, his home was not a safe place to be, and he would run to my house saying, I can't be at home right now because my mom's boyfriend is drinking, and he's acting out, and it's, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's a scary place to be, and I don't know how many times that happened, but I think about those repeated sets of trauma and how that would impact him, you know, when you're, when you're feel, fearful in your own home, and so that's something that he dealt with, and we've sadly long ago lost touch, but I just wonder, you know, how does that manifest in his life that that was something he saw and, and experienced repeatedly? You know, these same friends, we would get together and play, but we, it, was, it was often a time of bullying. You know, I hope I didn't reciprocate, but there were times where it wasn't fun. I just wanted to get out of there, but I didn't know how to say, hey, guys, this isn't fun. Why don't we play basketball instead of a game where we, like, trap each other under a blanket and hit each other and we can't get out. You know, it's like, that, that's real fun. We used to play a game called Net. Uh, this, is, this is very ther therapeutic for my soul. We used to play a game called Net, and, and like, I'd be trapped under there, not able to breathe, and it's like, okay, guys, can we go play football? You know, but it was like, I, as a kid, as a nine-year-old, ten-year-old, I didn't know how to process it. This is not a game I want to play, but how do I remove myself without them thinking that I'm, I'm the jerk or I'm the one who doesn't want to play with them, you know? And, it, and at the time, I didn't know how to process that, you know? I, I think that you know, on a number of occasions as a kid, I was probably on a receiving end of hurtful behavior that, you know, that, who knows? And now I'm really, who knows how it affects me, you know? Uh, this is how it affects me, you see what you get, you know? But, you know, I, I think, though, that I look back and I think there are a lot of times when that was not, that was not healthy, playful behavior, but it was, it was actually hurtful, it was destructive, it was harmful, it wasn't fun, I wanted to leave, but I didn't know how to separate myself from the situation. You know, we experience trauma in all kinds of ways. You know, one, one thing, you might not think of this as trauma, or maybe you would, but once I was in fourth grade, and I went to a friend's sleepover with about eight or ten other boys, and earlier that day, or at some point, the older brother had gone upstairs and snuck a, a beta, this dates it, but a beta videotape out of his parents' bedroom, and in the middle of the night, two, three in the morning, he puts this beta videotape into the VCR, and up on the, the screen is like a hardcore triple X movie. I didn't know how to process that as a nine or ten year old kid, or however old I was. You know, I just didn't, I just didn't have the tools in my toolbox to go home and say, Mom and Dad, I'm concerned about the rings that are being affected in my life. I mean, I make light of it, but that, that was something that I did not know how to process as a ten year old. You know, and, and when that gets lodged in your mind, you're kind of like in a fog, like, what was that? And I think trauma is sometimes like that, where you might not even realize how it's impacting you. You just know that it's not right, and it's foggy, it's confusing, and you don't know, you know, what to do with that. You know, just one, one other situation in my life, when I was in my early 20s, I was serving on staff at a really toxic, dysfunctional church. I'm sorry to say that there are some churches that are toxic and dysfunctional. And that's really heartbreaking to say about the church of Jesus Christ that should be a place of healing and wholeness, a place where, where sinners can find grace and forgiveness and, and where the broken can be made whole, a hospital for those who are hurting. This church had pockets of people where it was very life-giving, but there was a, a large contingent that was just all about power and gossip and making up false stories and spreading dysfunction and anxiety. And, and it was almost like the norm almost became, what's the fire? What's the, what's the blow up that's going to happen this week where somebody's character is attacked or where, you know, somebody is criticized unjustly or where the focus is not on how can we love the world, but how can we hate each other? That's a really sad commentary on a church. But sometimes churches become inwardly focused on in conflict instead of, hey, let's join together in love to, to bless and reach the world. 
And so I, I think, you know, that's obviously, we're not here to compare trauma. That may seem very minor. But when you're new in ministry and you wonder what, what bomb's going to drop now this week, you know, how are the people who are supposed to represent Jesus not going to represent him well this week? And uh, I'm just thankful that I had clinical pastoral education at the time to help process all of this as I was a, a, a young person in, in ministry. But um, so trauma can come in all kinds of ways. And, and some of what I've shared just now may, might seem naive compared to what's out there. I know there is, you know, everything under the sun that people have experienced. And, um, you know, we, we want to focus on, on growing and understanding and awareness so we can seek healing and, and, uh, and grace in our lives. You know, as we think about how there are so many people and places that can bring trauma one thing I think about as the church is how as a church and as a collection of individuals who make up the church, I hope that our prayer is always that when we encounter people, when people encounter us, we always spur them on towards healing and growth rather than harm and pain. Amen? Um, you know, one of the things, I don't want to embarrass him, but one of the things I tell my son, one of the things I tell the youth group is, it is a mark of Christian character and maturity when people feel safe around you. And if people do not feel safe around you, there is something going on in your heart and in your life that needs, that needs work. And I, th- I heard this verse this week, and, I, and it comes to my mind now, the verse that says if, you know, that, that people who aspire to be Christian teachers will be judged more strictly, or you know, that, that there's something about when you have influence or you have power or you're in a position where you can you know, be an influencer over the, the hearts, the lives, the emotions of people. There is great responsibility to, pe- to be people who, who work, work towards the, the love, the well-being, the shalom of others rather than agents of pain and uh, dysfunction. And so that's a question for us. As we think about experiencing the, the Lord's healing, which is our main focus, uh, a, a, a thing that goes right along with that is, Lord, help me to be a person who acts and works for the well-being of others rather than one that unintentionally or intentionally works towards their harm and, and, and their trauma. So when people experience trauma, it shows up in so many different ways. And just a, f- a few thoughts, you know, it can manifest as insecurity if, you, if you've experienced trauma or maybe fear of people and social situations. I talked about not being able to get close to people or to God Um, feelings of unworthiness. If you've been mistreated, how does that make you feel about yourself? Like you're not worthy of love or of grace or of mercy. You know, people might um, deal with their their trauma through excessive work or legalism or perfectionism. Uh, Anger might, you know, just just spew out of them because of what's buried deep uh, deep in their hearts. Um, Like I said, distance in relationships and and, uh, many, many more. You know, one thought that comes to my mind as we think about this topic is like, wait a minute, if somebody's born again, a believer in Jesus, aren't they made new? Isn't all of this healed when a person professes faith in Jesus? And don't get me wrong, putting your faith and trust in Jesus is the most important decision a person can ever make. It affects your, your relationship, your status before God. It affects your, your eternity, where you will spend eternity. I mean, putting your faith and trust in Jesus is the most important thing that a person can do. And in that moment, we are justified, we're forgiven, we're made new, we're made right with God. But that process of sanctification and healing, that often takes time. And we can have a love for God and we can pray and read God's word and even serve in the church. We can become followers of Jesus, but there might be stuff deep down that's not just automatically healed because we're a believer in Christ. But it's it's healed and made whole as we recognize it, as we confront it, and then we, we deal with the, we, we bring it before the Lord. We, we acknowledge that there was deeper stuff, and we talk to the Lord about it, and we actually deal with it. You know, scars and emotions, like I said, are not necessarily touched and healed by conversion and normal prayer, but for healing to take place, you know, Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Sometimes we have to unlearn or be deprogrammed based on what's happened to us so the Lord can reprogram us, renew our minds with his love, grace, mercy, and truth. Amen. We can be forgiven and know that heaven is our, our eternal destiny, and that's awesome. But as I, as I say often, the gospel is not just about getting us into heaven. 
but it's about getting heaven into us, into our hearts, into our minds, so that we're made new, we're made whole, we're made right, so that we can be people who work for the good of others without unintentionally bringing harm and pain into the lives of others. So, well, I think it's time to get to the scriptures. (laughs) Psalm 34. Everything I've said is, is based on Psalm 34, and I just want to touch on these verses that Dennis read for us. Where, where, you know, we sang, Anna sang so wonderfully for us, your praise will ever be on my lips. And, it, and it's a reminder in Psalm 34 that even when we are going through good times, bad times, traumatic times, the Lord's praise hopefully is on our lips because that's where um, hope comes. Psalm 34, 1, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. It's not easy to praise when you're dealing with the effects of trauma, when you're dealing with your stuff. But let's remember what worship and praise does. It lifts our gaze, it lifts our focus from our problems, from our pain. It lifts our gaze to the hope that we find in the problem solver, the one in whom we worship. That's what worship does. I mean, worship is for God. You know, sometimes people say, well, I didn't get anything out of worship today. Well, it's not for you, it's for God. But it does something for us. When we lift our gaze towards the Lord, we we redirect our focus from our problems and our pain on this level to our hope and healing on this level. That's a really important posture, and, and I've shared that, that you know, we don't just praise and worship when we feel like it. If we're hurt, if we're bruised, if we're battered, we may not feel like it. But when we lift up our gaze, it changes our posture, and it puts us in a position to receive healing and hope. And so we, we want to praise the Lord at all times as Psalm 34 begins. The psalm writer goes on, I will glory in the Lord And here's the good news, let the afflicted hear and rejoice. If we're afflicted by these memories, if we're afflicted by trauma, if we're afflicted by pain, broken relationships, brokenness, let the afflicted hear and rejoice. That's good news for us, that we can seek the Lord and his healing. Glorify the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me, he delivered me from all my fears. Oftentimes, trauma manifests as fear. You know, what's going to happen again? When's the next, you know, bomb going to drop? When's the next problem going to come into my life? When's the next wreckage, you know, going to be experienced? But I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. To seek the Lord here does not mean, like, where'd God go? But to seek the Lord means you're pressing into him. You're inquiring of him. You're investigating what, the Lord might, what might the Lord say to me or want to do in my life. You're, you're pressing in. You're not, it's not like, where did God go? But to seek the Lord is to press in and pursue him, to go after him. And so the question is, are we seeking the Lord for hope, healing, and direction, or are we just kind of stuffing? Are we, are we seeking the Lord with this stuff that might be buried, or are we just stuffing that and, and, and uh, you know, half-heartedly seeking the Lord? Verse 5, those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called. I I think about how this word means weak or um, humble, but it, it mostly means weak. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. And then verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. That verse, Psalm 34, 8, is so important because one of the side effects or the negative effects of trauma is that people are going to try to taste things to numb their pain. And the the concern here is then that just is going to compound the complexity. It's just going to add a layer of complexity upon layer because when you turn to something that's not the Lord, you're only inviting more pain and more dysfunction into your lives. A lot of people self-medicate with excessive alcohol or, or drugs or an inappropriate relationship or with pornography or any of these things that can, that can bring more pain and damage into our lives, our relationships with others, our spiritual lives, our thoughts. But Jesus is the fulfillment of this verse. Taste and see the Lord is good. He says, I am, I am the living water. I am the bread of life. Jesus wants us to feast on his word and his grace and taste and see that he is good and that when we are pressing into him, we can take refuge in him and be blessed. So taste and see that the Lord is good. It's just a, just a reminder. Is there anything that you're turning to, that you're tasting, hoping that will be something that can numb you or self-medicate you when the Lord's calling you to come and find nourishment 
and satisfaction in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So as we think about um, dealing with all of our stuff, you know, a few years ago, I went to just a wonderful training in some of my fire department chaplaincy work. It was critical incident stress management. And the metaphor that's so helpful, and I've shared this before just because I think it's really important, the, the metaphor is that every time, and it's geared for EMS workers, but every time they uh, arrive at a scene, you know, there's, there's taste, there's smells, there's sights that get lodged in our minds. It's like we all have stuff, and it's like that stuff goes into a wagon. You've been mistreated, you've been, people have spoken harshly to you, it's stuff that goes in the wagon, and as you pull that wagon through life, it gets heavier and heavier and heavier, and we need a place to unburden ourselves. We need a place to, to lay that stuff in the wagon so that it's empty and we can live freely and we can experience the Lord's love again. But as we think about trauma and pain that can just be stuffed in our lives, one of the important things to remember is in a world where people want to stuff it, oh, he doesn't talk about it, we need to somehow get what's deep inside and get that out in a healthy way. Not in a fit of rage or a fit of anger and bl a blow up at work or a blow up with a person, but we need to get what's inside out in a healthy way. It, it might, at the very least, be with a trusted friend saying, hey, how did that sermon land with you? What, what's some of the, the stuff that comes to your mind? You know, it might be journaling, you know, getting whatever you're thinking or feeling out on paper. You know, Pastor Rick Warren has a great quote, and he says, the revealing of the feeling is the beginning of healing. The revealing of the feeling is the beginning of the healing. As we start to close, what is the most powerful way for us to unburden our, the wagon of our lives, for us to take the, the stuff, the problems, the pain, and, and deal with it? Where do, we, where do we take that? The most powerful place we can go, the best place we can go, is to the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the verse that I think about is he was bruised for our iniquities. It's all of Isaiah 53, but it's this one. By his wounds, we are healed. It's a powerful verse reminding us that by the wounds of Jesus, our sins are forgiven, but our wounds are healed. By his wounds, we have been made whole, it says in, in Peter. And so it's, a, it's, pick, it's an echo from what is said in Isaiah 53. But we look to the Lord Jesus, and in his broken body, his broken, bleeding body, we have a place to take all of our wounds and all of our stuff and lay it before him, will he, where he will take it and bury it in himself and remove it from our lives. You know, Jesus came to deal with our sin and the sin of the world. And so, first and foremost, when we look at our lives, we realize that we're sinners in need of a Savior. We offer Jesus our sin, knowing that first he takes the sin, the wrongs that we've committed, and he takes it from us, and he buries it. And he offers us forgiveness and mercy in return. But here's something awesome about the cross. It's not just the sins that we've, commi that we've committed, but it's the sins that have been committed to us. So often we are dealing with trauma because of the sins of others. And, and we, we wonder, how am I going to deal with this? Who's going to satisfy it? Who's going to, who's going to make this right? How can I get revenge? How can I stew over this for the rest of my life? And, and the Lord is saying, that's not your burden to carry. I, know that I not only want to take the sin that you've committed, but I want to take all the hurt and all the pain and all the sin that's been committed against you, and I want to take that and bury it in myself where I will die, where I will be crucified, where I will take that and bury it and be raised to new life so that you can have that buried and buried in me and raised to new life. I think about Jesus, you know, reaching out to us with his nail-scarred hands. You know, when we think about the cross, we realize that Jesus has experienced the worst trauma that this world could ever experience. Crucifixion in the ancient Roman world was meant to be the most humiliating deterrent known to mankind. And so in crucifixion with Jesus, he was mocked, he was insulted, he was beaten. We talked about with Dr. David Watson at Family Bible Camp that crucifixion in the eyes of the Romans was for those people who got above their station in life, slaves that tried to run away from their masters, a, a, a Jewish man who claims to be the son of God, somebody who gets above their station in life and they need to be humbled and put in their place. They need to be made an example of to the entire world. And so Jesus was insulted, mocked, beaten, mocked as a, as a king, and he was stripped of his clothing, nailed to a cross, and hung up so the world could see him 
so he would be humiliating and die a, a terrible death. But it's in his wounds that we are made whole. It's in his wounds that we give him, we give him our wounds. He takes them into his body and buries them and offers us grace and healing in return. And so this morning, you know, like I always say, there, I always wish there was a quick fix. And, and the Lord can deliver us. I mean, so often in that verse, Psalm 34, we see the Lord is our deliverer. He saves us. He, he rescues us. But healing also comes through a process of learning to give everything that has happened to us, to give it to the Lord where we find healing. You know, it's in forgiving others that a lot of this can be healed. And forgiveness does not mean what happened to me was okay. Forgiveness does not mean I have to put myself in this position to be hurt again. But forgiveness means, Lord, I release that, that hurt. I release that person who's hurt me. I release them to you. They're not mine to deal with. Forgive them, Lord, for they did not know. They do not know what they are doing. Bring healing. Bring peace to my life. Forgive. I, I forgive them, and I, and I, I offer them to you to forgive them as I have been forgiven by you. So I just invite us to close our eyes this morning and uh, just to trust the Lord that he's able to take anything that's happened to us and he gives us the power, the courage to, to, for us to release that to him so he can receive it and forgive it and bury it. So just with your eyes closed, I just invite you to think about is there something in your life that's happened to you maybe this week, maybe 20 years ago that he wants to receive from you? that he wants to reach in and heal and take from you and he wants to bury it on the cross so that it's gone, so that it's forgiven, so that it's released, so that it's cleansed. The Lord wants to receive our sin. He wants to receive the sins that have been committed against us and he wants to bring healing and forgiveness. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the promise that's found later in Psalm 34 that you are near to the brokenhearted and you save those who are crushed in spirit. Lord Jesus, in a, in a room where this is such a sensitive topic, where many of us would not be comfortable sharing the worst of what we're talking about today, except with maybe a trusted friend or two and you, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give us the grace that we need, the mercy we need, to lift up to you anything that has hurt us, anything that has been stuffed. And Lord, help us to, even in this moment, to see you with your nail-scarred arms open with love. Help us to see you reaching down to us, ready to receive our pain, ready to receive our trauma, ready to receive our memories, ready to receive our thoughts that, that keep us brokenhearted. Lord, receive those from us and give us your grace. Give us your mercy. Give us your healing. Lord, as we talk about this topic, I pray that this would be a reminder that, it, that we can come to church and say it's okay not to be okay that you want us to acknowledge that we are, we are not perfect people that have it all together, but we are broken sinners in need of healing. And so, Jesus, give us the grace to admit that. And Lord, as we look at you, as we look at your love, as we look at you ready to receive our lives and to receive us into your family, into your plan of salvation, God, I pray that we would just have hearts ready to receive what you have, which is forgiveness and wholeness and your shalom. So, Prince of Peace, we turn to you. We place our lives in your nail-scarred hands, and we ask for you to bring healing. Well, thanks so much for coming to worship. As a church, we just want to be a part of what God is doing to bring shalom through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And if there's anything that I can do or that we can do as a church, if there's somebody that you need to talk to or pray with, please don't be shy, but just trust the Lord for courage to take that next step remembering that the revealing of feeling is the beginning of healing. And so let's remember that. And let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and his nail-scarred hands this week as we remember that he wants to receive from us. Anything that we've experienced that's painful, that's hurtful, he wants to receive that from us and offer us grace and hope and healing. Uh, if I can be of help to you, please don't be shy, but let's, uh, let's chat together and pray. Please stick around for hospitality time. As you go into this new week, let's just be filled with the grace and the love and the power of God ready to share hope with a world that desperately needs it. So as you go from this place, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Go in peace.